what we will introduce today is the notion of countability and uncountability, which just means if your cardinality is the same as the natural numbers. Then we will prove that the rational numbers are countable and the real numbers, as well as the irrational numbers, as a corollary, are uncountable. Last time, if you notice, we talked about the real numbers and how they were the same in terms of cardinality as the integers. Confused? Let's do a quick review. So, first of all, the cardinality of a finite set is just how many elements are in it. But the cardinality of an infinite set, like the natural numbers, can't, we can't just say it's infinity. We have to actually specify. So the cardinality of an infinite set A is equal to the cardinality of an infinite set B if there is a bijective relation. So there exists a f of x bijective such that f maps every element of A to B. So one example is, well, the natural numbers and the integers. We had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We start with 0 over here, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, 4, minus 4. You can see we have to define it piecewise, but it's still a bijective function because both of the piecewise functions are bijective. So for every even number, you will notice that the output is exactly one half. For every odd number, it's slightly more complicated. But basically, we subtract one from them and divide by minus two. So it's one minus n over two. So both n over two and one minus n over two are bijective. So this passes our test. And thus, the natural numbers are congruent to the integers. Not congruent. They have the same cardinality. So now. It turns out that the rational numbers are actually, well, I'll give you some statements. So, which one do you think is true? The rationals are congruent to the natural numbers, or the real numbers are congruent to the naturals? They have the same cardinality. Sorry, I keep saying congruent. Uh, there's a poor mathematics student stuck in my tongue today. I think real is bigger than rational. Yeah, but... Which one of these is true, if think, either are true? Uh, I think rational is congruent or to lesser. Okay, that's right. Looks like you still remember something from class. So the rational numbers are congruent to the real uh, to the natural numbers. So w what we call this is countable. But now it seems like pretty much every set in the book is countable at this point. So what about the reals? We can't, why aren't they countable? Turns out we can't find a bijective relation between them and the natural numbers. But if everything else had been so big, including literally like the rational numbers, how are the reals not working? Well, here's the thing. What we want to do with a countable set is enumerate it. So we have elements like a1, a2, a3, a4, so on and so forth. So for example, for the natural numbers, a1 is 1, a2 is 2, a3 is 3, a4 is 4. So quick, Dad, tell me, what is a60? Uh, 60. You failed the IQ test, but yeah, seriously. So it's 60. So uh, in this case, when we have the natural numbers, a n is n. So now, similarly, we can enumerate this for the integers in the same way. a1 is 0, a2 is 1, a3 is minus 1. So this determines how we can make a relation. So now you might be thinking, but wait, how do we enumerate, because this is the integers, and it's a little less obvious, but still pretty easy. How would we enumerate the rationals? Because there are no like, next rational number. We can't order them in terms of size, right? Because, let's see, we start with 0, obviously, but then, uh, assuming we go positive. But then, what's the f uh, first one going to be? Huh. Would it be 1 over 100? No, because 1 over 1,000 is in the set. Would it be 1 over 1,000? No, because 1 over 10,000 would be in the set. 
What do you think, Dad? What do we put as A2? 1 over N. It's supposed to be an actual number, not a variable. Mm. Okay. Right. 1 over A1 minus... It's supposed to be an actual number. Oh. No variables, no funky stuff. Just oh. a number. All right. So what is the biggest number? I don't know. Turns out we can't order it by size. Yeah. So we have to order it by something else. Infinite. So, we have to talk about the Cartesian product of two sets. So, do you know what the coordinate plane is, Dad? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So, if I take this point... Uh, okay. So, if I pick any point, the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate will always be real numbers, right? Yes. Okay. So then, what we have here is the Cartesian product of the real numbers by the real numbers. That is, is that the coordinate true? plane. Yep. This is not square, by the way. So, in the same way, the Cartesian product of two sets A and B means that if we have C is equal to the Cartesian product of A times B, then that means C is all, is the pair a comma b such that a is an element of a and b is an element of b so for example what would an element of okay so let's say we have the cross product no the cartesian product of the integers by the integers. What would an element of this be? C. Z squared? No, there is no such thing as Z okay. squared. So let's read this one more time. Because, uh, let's try plugging in the integers to this. So our specific case, let's call this some set S. S here is every pair of numbers, A comma B, such that A is an integer, and b is also an integer. So now can you apply that? Given this definition, how do we do this? What's an element of this set? All right, that's rational q. Well, yeah, it's good enough. You can say it's the rational q in some sense, but a more, uh, uh, so that's like the total of product. But can you give me just an element? Mm, I see. What because these are sets. That's right. Can I have a specific element? Element from the queue. All right. Element from the queue, I can say um, natural number. What? No. No, like a specific number. Like one oh. half. Oh, okay. Uh, pi? Is pi rational? No, pi is not rational. So let me give you, I don't know, one over three. Okay, sure. So, in this case, our number pair would be 1 and 3, because we have the numerator and the denominator. Turns out all fractions, rational numbers, have just an integer on the top and an integer on the bottom. Minus 1 over 2 has an integer on top and on the bottom. 1 over 3, which we just got, has an integer on the top and an integer on the bottom. 7 over 8 has an integer on top and on the bottom. So... It just makes sense. That makes it rational. Yep. Meaning that it has the it it the the number terminate at some point. Mm-hmm. So the rational numbers are just pairs of integers at their core. So now uh, I can't really erase that much because it's all necessary. So instead, here's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to draw a little table. So we have 1 and 1, and 2 and 2, and 3 and 3. Are you trying to do cantor? Yeah, it's related, and so on and so forth. So you keep drawing these. And no, I didn't learn this from like Veritasium. This is seriously what we covered in our class. So, and so on and so forth. 
So if we have 1 and 1, we get 1 over 1. If we have 1 and 2, we get 1 over 2. 1 and 3, we got 1 over 3. 1 and 4, we got 1 over 4. This is 2 over 4, which is 1 half. This is 3 over 4, which is 3 fourths. So it's 4 over 4, which is just 1. 3 over 3, 1, 1. So mm -hmm. it goes on and on. Can you see if you have time? Well, not really. But it shows us how we can actually enumerate this. So here's one idea. So let's say we have A1 is just the set that contains 0. Then let's say A2 is the set that contains 1 over 1, plus and minus. Let's say A3 is the set that contains plus minus 2 over 1 and plus minus 1 over 2. And this just means that it contains both positive 1 over 2 and minus 1 over 2. So A4 is plus minus 1 over 3 plus minus 3 over 1. You might be asking, where the heck is 2 over 2? If you already see the pattern. Well, we already counted something the same way in A2. To prevent any double counting occurring, we're going to make sure that every single fraction we have is in the least terms possible. 2 over 2 is not in smallest terms, so we don't include it. A5 is going to be plus minus 1 over 4, plus minus 2 over 3, plus minus 3 over 2, and plus minus 4 over 1. You might think, well, I know it might be less efficient, but why do we need to remove duplicates? Well, otherwise, we'll fail the horizontal line test, or in other words, our relation won't be bijective because two different inputs will give the same output, so it won't be injective, thus it won't be bijective. So, we have to make sure everything is unique. So this is how we start enumerating things. But how do we proceed with this? Well, let's think about it. Let's draw our line of natural numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on and so forth. So, let's take 0, first of all. So, this is the naturals, and this is L rationals. So, we have plus 1, minus 1. We have plus 2, minus 2 plus one-half, minus one-half. Then we have uh, plus three, minus three, plus one-third, minus one-third. And the thing about these sets is that every single one of them is going to be finite. Eventually, we're going to run out of fractions such that the top and the bottom are both natural numbers that sum up to the subscript. Eventually, we're going to run out of them. So it continues on and on, <clears throat> just being a sum of finite checks. 1 plus 2, because it's plus minus, plus 4, plus 4, plus 8, and so on and so forth. So you can see this pattern continue, and it's never going to run out. 12 is just going to be the first element of this, which is going to be plus 4, and so on and so forth. So it should be pretty easy to see where the intuition comes from. So that is how we enumerate Q. So how come this isn't the case with R? Well, what's the one difference between R and Q? The axiom of completeness. That is what differentiates them. So this uh, proof is actually a little bit harder. I haven't opened up my notebook yet, so let's take it out right about now. So let's see, this is just what I got to pretty early. Okay, so yeah, here we go. So let's say the reals were countable. Now my teacher likes to use x for any real number, so I'm going to follow that tradition. Let's say it was set x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. Right? So now, what we're going to do, we're going to draw our number line. No, we're not in third grade mathematics. We're going to do something more complicated with this number line. So, here's what we're going to do. Oops. Let's draw x1. 
Now, let's take and let's just ignore this part of number line. Let's say we're at the very start, or let's say this is r plus and x1 is 0 or something like that. So then we have the set of every possible interval that doesn't contain x1. So we have I, any x i1 such that i1 does not contain x1. So then, this is i1. Just a hypothetical. And all of them will be infinite sets, by the way. So this continues till the end of the number line. So then we have x2. And correspondingly, we have i2, which is a subset of i1 and cannot contain i2. So i1, such that i2 is a subset of i1. And in this case, it has to be an, a proper subset. Because otherwise, x2. Uh, because otherwise, x2 would be an i2, which can't be the case. So, essentially, what we have is in such that uh, xn is not in in, and in plus 1 is a proper subset of in. So, a corollary of the axiom of completeness that we covered last time was the nested interval property, or NIP, stating that the intersection of infinitely many infinite sets, or even infinitely many finite sets, such that each of them are a subset of another one, is never going to be equal to the empty set in the real numbers. We can disprove this for the rational numbers because of the axiom of completeness. So, with this property, we can say that while the intersection of these cannot be null, it has to have something inside of it. So that means the intersection from n equals 1 to infinity, i n, can't be null, right? So, now, let's think about what this means. If this has some element x, if x is in this whole intersection, then x is in i1, i2, i3, i4, and all of the following. But then, that would mean x cannot be any of the ones that we listed. Because otherwise, if x was x1, it would fail right here. x was x2, it would fail here. x was x3, it would fail here. Since it has to be in all of the intervals, then it cannot be any of the x values. But wait, that would mean x is not a real number. So the axiom of completeness gets twisted on itself, and this is disproved by proof by contradiction. So essentially, what we said here was that the real numbers cannot just be a set of, uh, cannot just be an enumerable set, even if it's infinite. It can't be enumerated because otherwise the axiom of completeness would be violated. We can, because otherwise we can draw a set of infinite intervals, which are all proper subsets of one another, such that 